morning, everyone. I'm Don Lupo, ThinkLA Executive Director. Welcome to The Gaming Evolution, How Brands Connect with Gamers, presented by Samsung Ads. We're glad you could join us this morning. And as a gamer, I'm very excited to hear this panel. Before we get started, a few more reminders. Please visit thinkla.org to register for our weekly newsletter and to stay in touch with our community. You can also renew your membership or join today as a corporate or a professional member. And I hope you'll all join us at our upcoming events. Our ever popular presentation skills workshop is coming up virtually in three lunchtime sessions on October 11, 13, and 15. On October 14th, we'll be discussing how to implement AR, VR, and mixed reality technologies for brands in our Think Thursday series. On October 21st, participate in our return to work town hall and discussion. We'll explore the issues surrounding returning to an office environment, so be sure to bring your questions. And thanks to longtime supporters, Samsung Ads, for sponsoring this webinar and adding to our lineup of great content for our community. And now, please welcome Deb Stambaugh, Head of Strategic Marketing, Americas, Samsung Ads, who will moderate today's panel. Hi, thanks so much, Don. And my name is Deb Stambaugh, Head of Strategic Marketing at Samsung Ads. I'm thrilled to have you all join us today as we have a powerhouse lineup and a packed agenda. We'll kick off our session today with a fireside chat with Brian Choi, Senior Director of Consumer Marketing for the Home Entertainment Division of Samsung Electronics to discuss Samsung's evolution in the gaming sector. Then we'll be sharing an overview of our latest gaming research, followed by a panel with thought leaders in the gaming space to really discuss our macro trends and how Samsung Ads is helping uh, top brands connect with this coveted audience. Now, before we jump in, uh, let me tell you a little bit more about Samsung Ads. So we're honestly the brand that people love most around the world. We're number one in smart TVs, mobile, Android, and the fastest growing in appliances worldwide. At Samsung Ads, uh, life really does run through us. And it runs through us because millions of people live their lives through Samsung smart devices, and we're helping consumers discover the content they'll love and the brands they want to buy. Samsung Ads has an incredible exclusive inventory and offers some of the most impactful experiences on TV and mobile. So let's dig a bit deeper into our Samsung Ads connected TV offering. With more than 50 million smart TVs, Samsung Ads has incredible first party proprietary automatic content recognition data, the largest in the industry and nearly three times any other provider. That gives us the scale and the understanding to know and find your audience in linear, uh, manage reach and frequency and measure with confidence. At the end of the day, to do what's really important, which is to help brands in the ga from gaming to auto to media entertainment, connect with consumers at every moment of discovery. Now I'm thrilled to really open up the conversation with Brian Choi. Uh, a little background on Brian. He has uh, led a passions-based marketing and innovation strategy for the US business for Samsung Electronics, really redefining the brand uh, to lead through service to the consumer. He's elevated uh, Samsung's efforts to deliver the ultimate home entertainment experience for gamers, streamers, sports fans, and delivered award-winning advertising and really first-of-a-kind partnerships with the likes of Xbox, ESPN, Netflix, and advanced, on an advanced innovation roadmap, all of which has really cemented Samsung's TV's leadership in the category. So welcome, Brian. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me. Great. So Brian, let's jump in. Um, talk to us a little bit about how Samsung Electronics thinks about the gaming space and how has this evolved throughout the pandemic and, and throughout COVID? Yeah, I think, um, you know, first and foremost, everything we do um, within our marketing organization is really uh, driven by the consumer. We're always looking at the consumer first. Um, and so we really try to anticipate what the needs are um, of our consumers and what they want. Um, and then also deliver elevated experiences around those, uh, the things that they want. Um, you know, we, we found that, um, you know, gaming was one of those uh, things that consumers tended to turn to uh, their TVs uh, when they really wanted the best possible experience. Um, and, you know, it was among that and a couple of uh, other verticals. So, you know, with that, we really wanted to make sure that we understood the gamer, focused on the gamer and delivered experiences that were uh, tailored to them um, and would delight them um, around uh, gaming specific needs. This really all started about five years ago um, when 
Um, you know, gaming, we saw that gaming was becoming increasingly mainstream. I think it's been very mainstream for a very long time, but, um, you know, the, the momentum really started building. Um, esports was really starting to take off. Um, and, you know, pretty much we came to the realization that everyone's a gamer these days. Um, you know, whether you're a casual gamer playing, you know, uh, a game on your phone to pass the time or uh, you're a hardcore PC or console gamer, um, you know, there was really a lot of opportunity to reach this audience. Um, and delight them um, in their own unique ways. So, um, and just as there are those different segments of gamers, um, you know, it's, it's very similar to what we see in uh, traditional media or going after like a sports audience. Um, you know, you can't just call gamers a, a homogenous group. Uh, there really are different experiences, different interests, different needs, depending on the type of uh, gamers that uh, these uh, individual consumers are. Um, so, you know, we've really been trying to build out experiences uh, that, that delight, again, uh, that gamer who's really interested in playing uh, or getting the best uh, possible experience on their televisions. Awesome. Thanks, Brian. So in the intro, I gave a little bit about, you know, some of the strategic partnerships. Can you talk a little bit about a little more about how those partnerships have really helped to uh, accelerate and elevate the Samsung TV experience for gamers? Yeah, absolutely. So I think if we take a step back and we really think about, uh, you know, whether it's gamers or whatever passion that you're into, um, our approach generally has been when selecting our partners or, or getting into the space um, is to work with partners where Samsung plus that partner can um, only deliver a new or better experience as a result of working together. Um, and that's always been at the center of, of the partners that we select. Um, because otherwise, I think, especially gamers, they're extremely, um, you know, they're extremely smart. Uh, they can smell marketing partners. Uh, from yeah. yeah. Um, and they're actually will be the first to call out brands who are doing it in an inauthentic or uncredible way. Yep. Um, so for us, we were really focused on making sure that we delivered the right experiences uh, for the gamers uh, in a way that was, uh, again, going to resonate with that consumer. Any specific partnerships, uh, particularly, I know you, we spoke a little bit about Xbox, um, anything specific to that partnership that um, you can speak to in terms of that authenticity, I think, uh, just especially as we started in that gaming space. Yeah, absolutely. So we actually first partnered with Xbox back in 2017. Uh, we've all obviously been in conversations with them for a while, but uh, it was at that time that they were getting prepared to launch uh, the Xbox One X uh, at the time, which was the first um, native 4K gaming console uh, that was available in the market. Um, you know, at that time, we were obviously selling 4K TVs. We had launched our QLED range. Um, and, you know, 4K adoption in the TV space just five years ago uh, was actually slower than we were, were hoping. Um, so we were really looking for uh, uh, a partner that could help us, uh, you know, trigger an upgrade to um, a 4K TV. So, you know, this was like a marriage uh, that was like made in heaven, right? You had a 4K gaming console, a 4K TV, um, you know, having the 4K console without having a 4K TV, you don't get the best out of the console um, and vice versa. So uh, we entered into an agreement to work together um, and really, uh, you know, tried to work together to push that gaming experience forward. Um, not only did we, uh, you know, uh, come up with like joint marketing activations, but we actually uh, aligned our uh, innovation roadmaps, et cetera, to make sure that every year, year in and year out, we were delivering the best possible gaming experiences and pushing that experience forward uh, for, that, uh, for the consumers um, in a way that we, neither one of us would have been able to do alone. Um, and, you know, that that relationship has continued to grow um, over time. And in fact, we were uh, their lead partner um, in the U.S. and Canada for uh, the launch of the Xbox Series X. Um, again, you have some amazing technology uh, that's built into this console that's now enabling 4K gaming at 120 hertz, which has never been done before. Um, and as a result of the partnership, uh, we were able to uh, you know, be ready with all of those next gen gaming features from the day that the console launched. Uh, which is not something that uh, every other manufacturer can say, um, which was uh, really exciting for us. Um, and beyond that, we're you know even working on uh, developing experiences that will surprise and delight consumers. We had a really cool activation last year called uh, QLED Code, um, which uh, allowed hardcore gamers to to really interact with both brands uh, in a cool and unique way. Uh, we also have some uh, really cool things coming up uh, this year. 
um, around some of the uh, launches that Xbox and, and Samsung are planning. So uh, a lot of cool stuff upcoming. Awesome, awesome. And, you know, really, to your point, that authentic experience, right? If you can't play the games at speed, right, what's the point and, and vice versa. So I love that in terms of that partnership and really thinking about that from a, a consumer lens and, and what's going to really deliver that the best experience for them. Um, let's switch gears a little bit. Where do you see the future of gaming heading? How, how's Samsung going to support sort of this culture, the marketplace? You know, I mean, I, I think right, gaming is not just for, you know, your what, what used to be the cliche of like your, your guy in the basement anymore, everybody's gaming. So how, where, where's Samsung going in, in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think that accelerator, uh, acceleration is just beginning. Um, and I think, you know, we're coming to the realization that, you know, maybe actually having, calling someone a gamer uh, is no longer gonna be, um, you know, relevant because to your point, everyone's a gamer, everyone's gaming um, at something. So it becomes then, um, you know, how do we, uh, work to create the very best forward thinking possible experiences uh, within gaming, you know, whether that's diving into the metaverse or whether that's just creating a uh, more uh, seamless and frictionless um, ability to play across platforms, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, looking at, um, you know, forward looking technologies, especially working with our, our gaming partners. Um, I think there's a lot ahead of us. I think there's a lot that's been um, that hasn't been even been tapped or imagined yet. Um, and, you know, certainly I think Samsung is dedicated and committed to making sure that we're at the center of all of that. Awesome. Brian, thank you so much for your time. That was great. I think it's just a great overview of, you know, why are we here? Why are we Samsung, you know, so invested in the gaming space and sort of leads us into our next conversation. So thanks so much for the time and uh, we'll be chatting with you soon. No problem. Happy to be here. Thanks everyone. All right. Thanks, Brian. Excellent. Well, so let me now turn this over to Nick Baranuevo, our uh, gaming head of gaming and sales partnership, our industry leader, about how Samsung Ads uh, is really uh, the latest in the gaming space and the latest in our gaming research. So, Nick, let me pass it to you. Great. Thanks, Deb. And what a what a really interesting conversation. Um, really appreciate that. Um, so. With our proprietary data, uh, we understand the gaming audience from both a hardware perspective and a behavior perspective. And our audience data and insights mean we can observe how gamers spend time on their Samsung Smart TV, whether they're watching linear TV or streaming content, um, or you know, the time they spend on their game consoles. And by leveraging our unique automatic content recognition technology that recognizes content viewership across linear TV, OTT, and gaming environments, our platform recognizes hundreds of the most popular game titles in the US and identifies each gaming session, allowing brands to reach players of specific consoles, games, and genres. And we can target and report on engagement and lift on those users and how they're exposed to our brand's ads and the kinds of actions they take. And we work with partners to reach gamers through brand safe advertising solutions across CTV, mobile, PC, and Samsung's exclusive smart TV ad experiences. And our native experiences reach gamers from the moment they turn on their TV as they enter their game console. And because our TVs auto detect active game consoles, we can also drive high visibility with a new premium ad placement in the game console launcher on Samsung TVs. And through our Samsung TV Plus and Samsung Content Network, we reach gamers in streaming and contextually relevant environments within ad-supported video uh, apps and also on our Galaxy mobile devices as consumers consider their next gaming experience. And because we know what games are being played and used on our devices, our enhanced audience targeting helps to capture real-time TV and gaming behaviors across the Samsung household. And the good news is, Gamers are reachable during their streaming time. Um, and in Q1 2021, for example, gamers spent more than three hours streaming per day. And over the past year, gamers' time spent with ad-supported video on demand outpaced subscription video on demand in terms of growth. So compared to last year of Q1 2020, gamers spent plus 46% more time with AVOD and 20 plus 24% more time with SVOD year over year. And, um, and this is a really interesting comparison and we're trying to keep this updated because we understand that during the pandemic, there was a spike, but what we're seeing is that continued growth even coming out of the pandemic. 
And so first, let's take a look at gaming behavior overall. Since 2020, there were over 17 and a half gamers on Samsung smart TVs. And it's no surprise with so much time at home due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, gamers were up plus 88% year over year in Q1 2021. And in addition, with the launch of the next generation game consoles in November of 2020, we saw average daily gamers surging on our platform. And this trend continues into 2021. And we see right now average daily gamers are up plus 33% in April of 2021, year over year, for example. And with the newly released game consoles from Xbox and PlayStation in November of 2020, we wanted to look at how those consoles affected gamers' engagement. So on average, what we found is that next generation gamers are actually spending more than twice the amount of time with their consoles than previous generation gamers. And we anticipate that overall time spent gaming will increase to levels notably higher than what we are seeing today. And when we think about this from an advertiser perspective, what matters is how can I reach them? How can I reach these gamers? And more than half of gamers' TV time was spent streaming and a quarter of time was spent gaming. This means nearly 80% of gamers' time on the Samsung platform are not exposed to traditional TV advertising, making CTV more critical than ever to connecting with this audience. Now I'm going to pass it back to Deb to introduce our panel. Thanks so much, Nick. That was great. And, you know, I think it just sets a great context about, uh, you know, really what what's happening in the gaming space, how are gamers interacting and the fact that they really are reachable within the streaming environment. And in fact, that's where they're really spending most of their time, which makes even, you know, sort of uh, the, the new dynamics around advertising with gaming even more important. So let me go ahead and introduce the panel here. Um, Nick is going to stick with us. Uh, we're so happy to have him. In addition, we're going to have Michael Bernardoni just joined us, Global Business Lead, OMD Activision, and Mike Lucero, Director of Gaming Product Management at Samsung Electronics, to really discuss the current gaming trends, how Samsung ads helps brands such as OMD and Activision really to connect with its audience. So welcome, everyone. Excellent. Thanks so much for joining. So let's dive in. I'm going to actually uh stop sharing for a second so that we can um we can see each other i think that's better fantastic um so mike lucero let's start with you how are we competing for gamers share of time in the world of entertainment like in its totality right now oh that's a <clears throat> that's a great question uh deborah so you know when i got into this business a long time ago let's just say um you know there were four consoles that were in existence there were three and then the fourth one came in and you know that was challenging enough at the time, and you know the the amount of sort of game time surface area that exists now for consumers has gotten so much bigger. You know now you've got you know the continued growth of live streaming with you know continues to grow. YouTube gaming uh, continues to grow. Esports continues to grow. So the things that have already been around for the last three or four years have already sort of you know multiplied the amount of options by you know an ordinate amount of uh, time. And, and a set of set of opportunities for to, to for your viewers to engage, um, and then you know in addition to that over the last few years you know, we've heard metaverse a few times that just continues to grow and grow, um, you know with the latest um, you know Ariana Grande on Fortnite um, sort of unveiling um, you know just the the, the streaming platform or the uh, the uh, gaming platform just continue to push more and more into that space. Um, so, you know, that again provides a whole other area of engagement and competition for eyeballs. And then lastly, um, you know, very interesting um, sort of perspective is that, you know, with uh, Netflix getting into the video game business, you know, suddenly you realize that the juggernaut on the, in the OTT world realizes the importance of gaming and that it's, you know, the biggest category and that they're missing out if they aren't, aren't participating in it. So there's all these trends going on that just sort of reinforce the continued importance of the gaming audience and all the engagement around gaming. Awesome, thanks, Mike. And and yeah, a lot going on, a lot to compete with. And and I think again, right, just makes it more critical for advertisers to sort of be in the right spot, which really brings me, Michael Bernardoni, to you. So, our audiences often stream more entertainment in general and gaming or gaming specifically. And what are you seeing as some of the drivers as one of the the you know the gaming leaders uh, behind this, the trends, the behaviors, etc. 
Yeah, I think I think it really is. Um, you know, the conditions are a perfect storm for consumption, just because of all the obviously the aspects that we're we're facing in terms of a pandemic. You know, leading up to this, I think it's changed all the users' behavior sets. Um, it's allowed parents to to encourage children, you know, to almost have more content availability than they were allowed previously. And, yeah. and we certainly know that, you know, um, everybody's got a certain amount of supply of, of what they can provide to entertain. <clears throat> so we've all turned to both streaming and gaming. Um, what we've learned though, through the lesson, lesson of this, and, and maybe one of the reasons why the impetus for something like a Netflix to push harder into the gaming space is the fact that the supply of content that's available to stream um, when it is all bingeable, it's it's all available. Um, it certainly wears out very quickly, and we saw that, you know, in the first pass of of the pandemic and staying at home. So what everybody started to 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 take back up onto was was gaming because it's perpetual in terms of you know open world formats, multiplayer universes, and that's where I think that um, we saw the most amount of growth in terms of the opportunity because once the game was the platform was produced. Um, it was limitless in terms of the amount of engagement it could provide to to users. Yeah, I know certainly in my household, there's a lot more gaming going on and a lot more yelling downstairs between the kids. So uh, absolutely, right? And, and you never get to the end. So there's always another game to play, uh, which I'm sure makes you guys really happy. Um, so let me switch uh, gears here for a minute. Nick B, I want to go back a little bit to the research that we were talking about and um, how endemic gaming companies are reaching gamers versus non-endemic companies that really know how valuable this audience is, right? This audience is, it's sort of critical to everybody, right? To the discussion we just had is everyone's gaming. So no one, you know, everyone's a gamer and no one's a gamer. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, I think uh, both endemic and non-endemic are really looking um, to reach this audience. And um, I think, you know, kind of a common theme is, um, is that audiences are embracing streaming at such a rate that advertisers kind of all advertisers must take sort of like a fresh look at their media mix and um, you know the balance of whether it's linear tv and ad supported streaming or really you know any sort of media um, sort of type and uh, you know going back to the research for example uh, with more than 80 percent of those gamers spending their time in a streaming or a, a gaming environment if you are, you know, an advertiser looking to reach that gamer audience, you know, on Samsung smart TVs, you're risking missing eight and 10 potentially um, gamers with your message if you're not balancing your media strategy accordingly. Um, and, you, you know, um, I know in the news and we've recently, Samsung ads has come out recently with, the, with, the, with its rule of 40 initiative to help, um, it, you know, help advise our partners on how to reach specific audiences in ad supported video. And I think that's really great. Um, you know, and we're, we're speaking with gaming partners. I know the non-endemics are speaking with their partners and, um, you know, essentially, you know, Samsung ads is building this predictive campaign planning tool that um, is for connected TV and that can advise for optimized reach or frequency and investment um, against sort of hard to reach audiences like the gamer audience. And, um, I think that's really interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's really been exciting as we've sort of been talking more and more about this rule of 40 about how it sort of so neatly applies across verticals. And certainly right where you have a really strong gaming audience, understanding how you find that balance, I think has been really critical to, to a lot of advertisers. So really exciting stuff there. Um, Mike Lucero, let me come back to you for a second. So. Where do we find them? How do we connect with them? Can you really weigh in a little bit more from a hardware perspective in terms of like capturing that audience as they, you know, sort of turn on the screen, right? As they start to engage. Sure, absolutely. And it's a really good point. I mean, as Brian had mentioned, you know, over the years, we've made a lot of investments on the hardware side where the experience is just better on our TVs. And gamers know that, you know, I've done tons of research with gamers and, you know, we continue to hear that, you know, our, our TVs are just a great place to watch, to play games. And there, that, that's, that, that's actually an added benefit of that is that, um, you know, game developers want their experiences on the best possible screen as well. So, you know, we're actually able to curry more um, sort of a favorable position with game developers as well, which, um, you know, will ultimately help 
us and the developer to have a continued partnership to create better content on our TVs. Um, and, you know, having these on our, you know, on our, being able to put that foot forward, you know, makes the gamers feel better about that experience as well. So at the end of the day, it goes back to that authenticity. It's like you really want to be able to give them the best possible gaming experience. And then ideally some of the other things as well. And you've got on some of our platforms, we've got great, um, you know, gaming video content, for example. So having that in its, in its best possible foot forward factor as well is also another benefit. So just great picture quality, authentic curation of content, all these things come together uh, to sort of really connect with the gamer in a way that works for them. I think that's what it's all about. Excellent, excellent. Um, Michael Bernardoni, let's talk about how Activision has used CTV a little bit. Let's get into like maybe a little bit more of a case study here. So tell us a little bit about like, who you've been trying to reach, uh, you know, again, within that gaming space, what's been most effective for you? And, um, you know, uh, give us a little insight on, on what other gamer gaming publishers should be thinking about as they really look to leverage CTV as a, as a medium. Yeah, well, I certainly don't want to give away all the, the secrets, but um, I think I think overall, we can all understand that uh, there's there's really a layer cake of engagement that can be applied to the world today. Um, and we all describe that in terms of looking at it from the funnel. Um, you have a top of the funnel, which is, of, of course, big cultural moments um, where you can get the most proximity to um, big engagement and brand amplification. Um, the mid funnel, which I think most adequately is the place where uh, a CTV really has a place into, into the layers of that in terms of saying, how can you get more of that, um, that, that uh, recency in terms of engagement with the right sorts of audiences and dial those in more targeted and more effectively and, and then you get to the lower uh, lower band, which is where we start to convert users and you know, look at performance media. So the way that we, we certainly um, approach it from, especially from a Samsung ads perspective, is just having an ecosystem that is end-to-end -end and measurable and certainly consistent with higher resolution understanding of what the, the right audience can be and, and where we have that opportunity almost as a canary in a coal mine for for broader aspects of the strategic um, deployment of different channels and different sorts of creative and in, in the places where we're not just going into an endemic space, but we're looking for growth opportunities that um, certainly are incremental to, to some of what our franchise represents. Yeah, and I think what's interesting too, and we talked about this earlier, right, is you know, folks sort of got to the end of streaming content. And so to a degree, right, gaming is also competing with other mediums and other forms of entertainment. Michael, uh, did that influence sort of how you thought about your campaigns at all, right? That you're competing really with not just other gaming entities, but, you know, with sort of entertainment at large. Yeah, I, I really think that it's no longer a category. It's, it's, um, it's creating culture, not competing in a category. And, you know, we could, it, certainly it's not just, you know, like an Activision or any of those sorts of um, prospects as we talked about, it's even, it's even other sorts of streaming content uh, producers. It's even to Facebooks, it's even to Twitches. Everybody is trying to look at what this paradigm means and what culture is, and it moves so fast and it's, and it's really doesn't have the same linear logic and approach that we needed to, um, you know, to have a, run a playbook with before. So I think that that's where it starts to understand where you have to um, look at how the paradigms are changing and where you can really start to insert yourself really, rather than just being in the way of culture, but how can you start to influence it and move it through uh, the right sorts of channels and touch points so that we can we can look at what those different uh, engagement points mean in terms of, of what we're trying to deliver for the brand and through the business. Awesome. So Nick, as you look at sort of across your spectrum of clients and customers, um, can, are you seeing similar patterns uh, for with other buyers as well? Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, just building on on some of what Michael was saying, and then also some of our research that we found. Um, I think what we're seeing is, uh, you know, most similarly to the endemics, you know, entertainment um, streaming apps uh, partners like that 
you're seeing an, uh, sort of a evolution of how gaming um, publishers and, and, and uh, sort of are looking at this space. Um, so in addition to CTV and reaching sort of gamers and the ad supported video apps, which we sort of spoke about, uh, you know, we've definitely found that there's opportunities to connect with these gamers before they're, you know, entering their gaming or streaming session, right, all together. Um, for example, you know, gamers are spending 20% more time in the smart hub, um, you know, than the overall Samsung audience. And for those not familiar um, uh, in, in this, uh, in this uh, meeting, um, the smart hub on Samsung smart TVs is where sort of our consumers sort of start their journey, right? That's where they spend time um, navigating and discovering new content and apps and, and uh, games to play. And so I think leveraging smart home ad opportunities given, you know, gives our advertising partners the ability to reach gamers before they enter and also after they're sort of completed with their gaming or streaming sessions. And that's really helped us utilize this approach to sort of combining all of these um, sort of up, um, these tactics to really increase that level of you know, um, incremental reach and gameplay conversion, and uh, also be able to deliver sort of a more holistic set of insights into, you know, these, these partners, um, audiences and their cross device behaviors. So. Yeah. And I think what, what, right, Nick, what we're finding is, right, it, we're really able to, because we've got so much of the insights and the understanding of the consumer behavior coming off the TVs all the way through to measurement at the end of the day, uh, it really has become an end-to-end -end solution within this gaming space. So that's been really powerful. Absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, I th and, and, you know, that's kind of what we get excited about, you know, and um, that's the most exciting part about working with our partners is, um, you know, for us too, it's really, we're all learning together and, um, you know, exploring this new space and really um, it's a real true partnership. So it's, it's very gratifying. Yeah, yeah. A lot of fun. Uh, let's do a bit of a lightning round, guys, and then we're going to get into a little bit of production. So, uh, Mike B, uh, Michael Bernardoni, talk to us a little bit about. So we had a couple of mentions of the metaverse. What's your What's your perspective on that? So there's a lot of perspective here. I mean, we could we could literally spend days on this um, this idea, but I'm going to try and just make it a little bit more simple for people to understand and then yep. we can get into a bigger sort of broader implication Perfect. so when we talk about um you know what a metaverse can can mean it's really more about the next phase of convergence so before convergence was all about um, interdependent interconnected and transparent and that's where data came and mobile connects this cross device now what we're really getting into is um interdependent, interconnected, and immersive. And so when you start to talk about that, there's some examples and it gets thrown around as a buzzword word right now, because just like Convergence did in yesteryear, I think right now what we're talking about is where users can come in, they can um, become a different sort of character, they can buy different sorts of um, you know, weapons, hot air balloons, whatever those things might be, and they can world build together. And so that's the notion of it right now. But what it really starts to mean and where everybody starts to get excited and you have all the sorts of um, ingredients starting to come together for a true metaverse. I think what's really, really, really interesting is there's been three touch points um, in the years that really gave indication of what it is. And if we look back, the first was 1999 um, and that's when the matrix came out. And so the matrix came out in 1999, which was the whole simulation, right? That's, that's the whole idea of the metaverse and, and what, that could, what that could start to imply. And that's also when 3G uh, was first re released, which is you could send pictures. Second key seminal tipping point was in uh, 2010. So 2010 is when 4G was released. And that's when you were able to stream video and streaming video um, was something that gave rise to uh, Facebook mobile, right? And so that was the first time that uh, mobile penetration usage um, overtopped television. And so now what we have is 10 years later, we have Matrix 4 is being released. And it's also when 5G is, is, is now in its advent. Now it's not here yet, only 1% of the population really has high band um, ultra wideband 5G. So you're not really feeling the effects of that at scale. That'll take a lot more equipment build outs and those sorts of pieces because 
5G, while it carries a lot of data, it doesn't have a lot of range. So right now that piece is in place. The second is we have crypto and NFTs, so blockchain enabled formats. Those will start to enable people to go into worlds and to build them or even create real estate so that you could start to say a brand in the future in the metaverse could actually create a, a, a piece of real estate, a storefront or experience for users to own, operate, and experience together. So that's where it's really headed. And that's what's really exciting about this proposition. Um, and the second thing is like you have right now, it's the next foray into the metaverse would be uh, the next logical uh, springboard would be the mobile internet, what it becomes of that. So when we talk about gaming, mobile, mobile internet dwarfs the rest of what you know console gaming can mean in terms of user bases around the world. So. What's exciting about this and, and the progression of, of, you know, as we move forward, the devices get smaller and smaller and more featureless until they disappear. And that's when you enter the, the metaverse. So once the mobile device actually disappears because you have something like Facebook smart glasses, which they were just, you know, rolling out and Moore's law continues more of how do you uh, get past some of the things in terms of battery and power and those sorts of bits and you move those to the cloud you can have an immersive experience on your face at any point you want, which I, you can see that that's, that that's where we're headed. So those ingredients are all taking shape, but like we've seen from 1999 to 2010 to 2020, now you're gonna see over the next 10 years, the metaverse will start to form. A little scary, a little, little exciting, all at the same time, I love it. Um... Mike, uh, Mike Lucera, we were talking a little bit when we were prepping for this about the fluidity of sort of culture and technology. Tell us where your thought is on uh, on how that's going to progress. Sure. Yeah. And I really appreciate Michael B's sort of perspective on the history of the metaverse. And I think that plays right into, you know, some of the big trends there. You know, obviously, um, you know, NFTs are going to be a very interesting thing to keep an eye on uh, in terms of how that brings new sort of value. Uh, for creators and for publishers and for potentially even brands um, in the in the metaverse. And I, what I find very interesting right now is, again, it goes back to culture and crossover. You know, more and more of the artists that um, are spending time and energy with their fan bases in um, in the metaverse, you know, Dead Mouse and uh, Manicor, you're sort of building a, you know, a universe there around, you know, with, with a participation of his community. It's very exciting. He's got a very engaged audience and he's been, you know, he was a big Twitch streamer as well. So he's bringing sort of the very one, I'll call it a one dimensional uh, business model that was a Twitch and Mixer um, where he was successful on both platforms. He's bringing that into this sort of multifaceted um, sort of business model where he has direct even more direct um, contact with his with his audience than in with the, with the simple mechanisms of a Twitch or a Mixer. Um, so that brings a bunch of things potentially interesting to that platform as it continues to expand and you know as fans come together. Um, I like the, what Michael talked about community. You know, community is always going to be such a huge part of this. These fan bases are a big part of that as well. And you know Roblox is getting in the mix as well with uh, Twenty One Pilots. Um, so, you know, that seems to be sort of the, the, one of the tips of the spear is around artists being in there and really, you know, bringing their fan bases in there in a super exciting way. So I look forward to seeing how that manifests itself and then where that goes, what that means for NFTs as well. And then the question I have that maybe Nick can answer is, you know, what, what does this mean for brands? You know, there's, um, I think there's a great opportunity for brands here. Um, and as part of the value exchange to bring something into the mix here. So it could be some very interesting brand opportunities for some of those brands that are willing to take some risks. Nick, what do you yeah. think? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, I think, no, this is, um, this is great. Uh, I think, you know, just to try to add and not, um, not duplicate, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I think obviously adding new revenue streams and business models, that's like one of the most exciting things around, around, what, you know, what this could mean, right? Because it really then helps support the entire ecosystem. Um, and that's like super important. And at the same time, you know, to Mike's point, I think what brands are trying to figure out and, you know, there's been some amazing integrations and examples of it, whether, you know, entertainment studios in the games or, or you know, uh, a shoe brand that just recently activated within a game, you know, and um, created a whole, a whole, a whole environment or, 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 you know, uh, 
folks releasing exclusive items that are NFTs that maybe you can only get through one of these experiences. I think that's all really exciting. But in general, what you're trying to do is create motivations for gamers to sort of stay engaged and keep playing. Um, and I'm just speaking about a gaming environment. Obviously, the metaverse applies to much, much, much broader context. But, um, but I think that's really exciting. And I think, you know, um, brand integrations is something that's already happening. Um, sort of this, 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 uh, this creator economy is starting to happen, right? The growth of creator content within, you know, creator generated content, I like to call it, not UGC, um, within, within, these er within these areas that brands can also participate in, right? And sort of extending um, and delivering their own content. And then also I think in-game advertising, which, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm old enough to uh, remember when I was part of sort of maybe V1 of in-game in advertising industry. And, uh, and I think, you know, now with, um, you know, games as a live service, um, sort of, you know, more of a reality today than it ever was, um, ad technology has become much more sophisticated than it used to be. Um, I think there's, you know, it's just going to be, su I'm super excited about seeing sort of how the in-game advertising um, uh, sort of industry evolves around this idea of the metaverse, not only in mobile, which um, I think there's a huge opportunity, but also in you know, PC, console, and then eventually cloud gaming as well. So a lot of great, you know, um, just uh, areas to explore and I'm, um, you know, just really excited about it. Awesome. Well, and you know what's so interesting about I think all three of the conversations or all three of the topics that you guys hit on is it sort of comes back to that authenticity statement, right, that we started with at the beginning. It really has to be part of the experience. It has to add to the experience. It has to be a value add to the experience for the consumer and for the gamer. Otherwise, it's not it's not valuable. So, um, you know, the you know, from the metaverse to, uh, you know, brand experiences and whatnot. Um, it's just a you know, we're, we're, I love where gaming is going, that it's really democratizing um, a lot of the engagement, right? It's making it really accessible, really personal. And I think that's what a lot of us, you know, are looking for from entertainment. So uh, I think gaming is leading the way. Um, let's talk a little bit about the future. So I want to talk a little bit about predictions. So Nick B, I'm actually going to start with you on this one. Uh, predictions for the future. What does the next, I don't know, five years look like in gaming? Give me your, give me your best shot. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't, you know, there's some things I can talk about, um, <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, I think, I think just fundamentally what we're seeing today, so let's say just like today for the next three to five years is we're seeing from a media perspective, um, you know, the, the consumer consumption trends, right? And um, we're sort of seeing that in terms of technological innovation. Um, but also in, you know, ad technology and, and the media industry, right? And we're seeing the shift to the idea of um, streaming content, streaming gaming, whatever it is, um, uh, being enabled by that technological in, uh, innovation, um, but also uh, the ability to, to reach these, you know, these, 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 these audiences like the gamers and others where they're sort of um, shifting their consumption trends too. So that's just an exciting trend to continue to, to watch and be part of um, Samsung, I know is is really, um, which is super exciting. You know, really invested in 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 being part of that, whether it's on the television or the mobile device or or whatever it might be. Um, I, I think also, you know, something that I'm excited to see just proliferate is, um, you know, obviously because of the semiconductor chip issues, um, you know, the the next gen consoles haven't really reached sort of um, critical mass yet. Um, you know, I think that's that's going to change um, or sort of just um, happen over the next few years. It'll you know they'll, they'll really start to enter the market, and what you'll see is the game publishers really start to develop for those next generation gaming experiences. And I think that's going to be a real boon for um, you know the economy and um, you know just the gaming industry um, over the next like two to four years. And then of course you have um, you know uh, cloud gaming, which I think you know is just um, speaks to. Um, the idea that, uh, you know, a gamer can access and play, you know, premium quality games on any device. And, uh, you know, that's sort of the, the evolution of streaming content, um, per se. And, um, and then just real quick, from a Samsung um, perspective, I'm really excited um, about the types of ways that we're thinking about leveraging um, audience intelligence and thing, you know, um, technologies that, you know, are pretty 
um, standard within the industry, but specific to Samsung and sort of what we can do in that space and how we can do that, uh, utilize that to drive um, increased engagement with gamers, um, find more gamers, you know, to, to play the games of our partners, um, find more gamers to be more engaged in, in different experiences. And, um, you know, that's by harnessing, you know, the power of like our Samsung ads data and our machine learning and new ad experiences. Um, so that's really exciting. But, um, you know, in general, Samsung ads, is, I'm super excited about just supporting all the great work that all these folks are doing uh, um, here on the panel and in the industry. Um, it, but specific to Samsung, it's really, you know, supporting these experiences that are going to work across our different devices, right? All of our devices, whether it's leveraging the advancements in smart TV, 5G, which, which Michael spoke about, uh, mobile, and uh, these AI technologies, um, you know, continuing to deliver you know, new innovative products and services for the gaming and advertising community, so. Awesome, thanks, Nick. Uh, Michael Bernardoni, let's uh, get, let's hear your predictions as as you know, sort of at the center of it all. Yeah, so I mean, I think I laid out a couple couple of things that were you know pretty heavy, and without to say like this is exactly the way that these are the necessary ingredients to start to make enrich this experience, make it more immersive. But I think what's the most important one is what's the point of play, right? So I think we've talked about that with um, you know previously with. We have an immersive experience that's 4K now. You have next generation that's fulfilling that sort of proposition. Um, but I think it starts to get into, as we evolve more, uh, we'll have more touch points to come into that in and out of the point of play. So whether you're bringing mobile into uh, the living room from the gaming standpoint, whether you have opportunities to go immerse deeply with VR, um, I think that that's where it starts to extend uh, the engagement footprint of what it starts to, to be. And then from those, that's where I think we have, what's the manifestation of, it's a social platform that will start to bring in, um, say theatrical uh, production, right? So we now we have music in there. We have, you know, you should go to, to watch the box office, you know, release yep. in these spaces, right? So that's the convergence that I, that I see um, and that's a natural sort of evolution. I think what gets really interesting though, is when you start to co-op the users um, almost as a profit sharing too, which is, is a virtuous sort of an idea where they can start to construct other sorts of elements to the world like you have, which is inherent to Roblox, uh, Minecraft, those sorts of pieces, but they start to get into more of the mature categories like say a Call of Duty, like what those things can mean where you give the tools available for the creation, but then not only just being right now, everything is at scale. So culture seems to be everywhere, whenever it needs to be. But I think that what would be interesting is in the future of this is we get more local ideas of environments that are constructed from the people of those places. So you almost start to get into a place where you have in-game uh, travel agencies too, you know? And I think that that's where brands can all come into the same sort of a platform that's not really gaming and export. It is gaming, but it becomes uh, something more inclusive of all those different properties. Truly bring culture in. Uh, Mike Lucero, last one for you. What is your, give me, let's hear where you're, you think this is all headed. Sure, sure. So I think we've already talked about a lot of it. So I'm not going to um, sort of go into some of the stuff we've already talked about. I think there's great conversations here. Um, the thing that I'm most excited about that's happened just in the last month or so is for me, the question always has been around, you know, I think cloud streaming is going to play an important role in the future of, um, of content distribution um, on big and small screens alike. And the question I have always had is like, when is the tipping point going to occur? You know, I've talked to tons of gamers and they're all sort of a little skeptical that it's going to be as good as it's promised. Um, you know, there's a lot of services out there. They're actually all pretty good, but you know, people are skeptical about, you know, whether it's really going to deliver the, that sort of top-notch gaming experience they expect. So when, I, when Gamescom, at Gamescom, Xbox announced that they're going to be sort of extending their xCloud sort of on the back end of their, um, of their consoles, multiple generations, to me, that is potentially the tipping point. Michael Gabe referred to these tipping points. I'm thinking my hope is that that might be one of those tipping points that occurs where that really sort of creates enough believers into understanding that that actually is an improved form of distribution. It's kind of like the digital downloads was, you know, eventually became the norm. It took a while for that to happen. You know, likewise, 
um, with a big player like that, with that many millions of subscribers, you know, hopefully that will get some comfort level across the industry um, where that can really be impactful um, and, and prove that it actually is going to be the future. And I think then, the, you know, the, the, the gates will really sort of um, um, sort of open up and then I think consumers will embrace it. It'll bring probably a lot more gamers into the fold because, you know, not everybody wants to spend $500 on a console they can't get. Now, um, how frustrating is that? So I think then, um, you know, we really do have a transformational moment in gaming that I think we're all going to be very excited about. Awesome. Uh, I know my my family will be super excited to be able to do that as they're already hawking me for the next Xbox. Um, <laughs> la- uh, so guys, we're going to wrap it up. I want to ask one final question, starting with you, Mike Lucero, favorite game? The, right now, I'm still playing Ratchet and Clink right now. I didn't, didn't get that far into it. And when I bought it about six weeks ago, so I'm, you know, deep into, into Ratchet and Clank right now. So awesome. you know, hope to finish it. Mike Lucero or Michael Bernardoni. Yeah, it has to be Call of Duty. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's certainly, well, I'd get skinned alive if I didn't say it, but it's actually true. Uh, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, I, I went deep into Warzone and everything subsequent to that. And it's been <clears throat> really kept me close to a bunch of friends and, you know, and family playing, playing that game. So I understood its social value from, from an entertainment standpoint. And yep. it's, it's given me immense um, joy, fun, and, you know, sorrow during those times. Of course. <laughs> of course. Nick, favorite game. I'm not pandering. Um, Warzone did get me through uh, the pandemic. Um, so I'm a big Warzone player. Uh, I also, you know, for some reason, I really enjoyed Outriders, which was a game that came out also. Um, I just like the, it's just really well done, I thought. And uh, so, yeah. Amazing. You guys were a fantastic panel. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Think LA. And uh, Don, I think I'm going to hand it back to you. And thanks so much, everybody, for watching. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. That was great. Uh, I have to put my vote in for Battlefield. So <laughs> thanks to Brian Troy, Nick Barrio Nuevo, Michael Bernardoni, Mike Lucero, and Deb Stamba for sharing your experience and your insights. And thanks to Samsung Ads for your continued support. And thanks to all of you for joining us this morning. We'll be sending out a survey later today, and we rely on your feedback to make our events as relevant as possible for you. We'll also be posting a recording of this event on our website, as well as a podcast of the audio. So please take care, stay safe, and we hope to see you again very soon.